My name is Sue Dulick. I'm on the board of the ICFRC, and I'm the host for today's program. The ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, our volunteers, our interns for making these forums possible since the year that Return of the Jedi was the number one movie, 1983. And I want to acknowledge uh, our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the U of I's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their truly crucial financial support, as well as today's financial special sponsors, Mike Carberry and John Menninger. I also want to thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2, as well as the UI Library's digital archives. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Wrights of our law school here, who will introduce our speaker. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Kendi. Mark Kendi, as you heard, is the James Madison Chair in Constitutional Law at the Drake University Constitutional Law Center. And he served as, uh, uh, first as a professor of law at the University of Montana, in addition to serving as a visiting professor of law at several institutions, including University of Paris II, University of Nantes, and Notre Dame. As uh, we were asking Mark at, uh, as we ate uh, how he got involved with the South Africa, and he said it was because he was invited to serve as a visiting professor of law at the University of Stellenbosch when he was, was there as a Fulbright scholar, uh, Fulbright senior scholar. And... Um, so it's been a great um, uh, association ever since because he's really produced a lot of literature, uh, a lot of scholarship about uh, South Africa. He started uh, even before he went to South Africa as a, uh, someone with a great interest in constitutional law and, hu and uh, the exercise, of the defense of human rights in this country. But he now, uh, his f expertise focuses not only on constitutional law, but comparative constitutional law, of course, civil rights, cyber law, and civil procedure. Uh, he's published a, a lot of books uh, relating to, uh, he's published a lot of books and articles relating to uh, South African politics in particular, uh, especially the current state since the end of the apartheid period, and that's of course why we've asked him to come and speak to us. Uh, Mark's notable, most notable work probably, or uh, biggest book anyway, is The Constitutional Rights in Two Worlds, South Africa and the United States in 2009. So please join me in welcoming my colleague, uh, Mark Kendi. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. This is a wonderful organization. I'm learning about it, and you do tremendous things. I want to thank John and Sue for their kind words, and Ed for his work, and others for, I'm sure, the organizational work uh, behind what you do. Uh, and I will say, uh, the weather today is slightly more uh, similar to South Africa than it was yesterday. <laughs> so that's a good thing. <clears throat> On April 6th of this year, uh, the former president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, appeared in a South African court where he is facing numerous charges of corruption, racketeering, fraud, and money laundering. This is rather extraordinary. Most of the charges actually arise from a 1999 arms deal in which some of Mr. Zuma's then leading financial supporters, um, some who were the most notable, were convicted of corruption, uh, although he was not prosecuted at the time for various reasons I'll actually talk about. Uh, he was certainly uh, frequently mentioned during the trial. April 6th was an extraordinary yet conflicted day because on the one hand, Mr. Zuma had actually and was actually honoring a pledge he'd made promising to show his innocence if he given the chance in a court, even though his lawyers and the African National Congress government had fought for over a decade to prevent such judicial proceedings. In a similarly contradictory way, April 6th was both a victory for the rule of law and democracy under the new constitution, or it's not so new anymore, 1996, but it still rings as new to me in certain ways. Um, yet it was a demonstration that political and other governmental actions that had been occurring in the country had led the country in a troubling direction during Mr. Zuma's nine years as president. My goal today is to discuss some of these political developments in the context of the 1996 South African constitution, and how the rulings of some of their courts 
over the last 20 plus years have played a role in this political situation. Now the interim, the interim national president is Cyril Ramaphosa, who was actually the chief negotiator for the African National Congress during the constitutional negotiations with the white apartheid government and other constituencies back in the 1990s during the transition. Though Ramaphosa was Nelson Mandela's preferred choice as the nation's next president, the ANC party, the African National Congress party, which was uh, the party Mandela was a member of and in a sense the leading party opposing apartheid, uh, went in a different direction and chose someone who's often described as a technocrat revolutionary. That sounds contradictory, maybe it is, but certainly someone who was a revolutionary with the ANC but who had a sort of technocratic way of approaching things named Thabo Mbeki. However, Zuma's populist followers eventually ousted Mr. Mbeki by gaining control of the African National Congress around 2007. <clears throat> but in December of just this past year, 2017, Ramaphosa prevailed in African National Congress elections, as some of you may know, and he preferred over Zuma's preferred choice, even though at the time, and this is awkward, Ramaphosa was Zuma's national vice president. <laughs> Interesting situation. It has been said in South Africa that the president of the ANC is more powerful than the president of the government when they are different, and that it's only a matter of time than for the ANC leader to govern the country. Indeed, ANC revolutionaries had been trained to put party first. And so in February 2018, Mr. Zuma resigned as the nation's national president and Ramaphosa became the interim national president because otherwise you would have had quite the awkward situation of one person in charge of the ANC and one person in charge of the national government. How do these political developments in the Constitution connect? Well, let me provide a little bit of background on uh, the legacy of apartheid the horrors of apartheid in terms of how it came to exist, how it came to an end, and how a multiracial constitutional democracy was established. So obviously, the white Afrikaner part of South Africa put apartheid into effect. And over the years, pressure built against apartheid because it was an oppressive, brutal, racist regime. And the pressure came from revolutionary ANC members on the ground and abroad against the government. I have friends, for example, who are in the United States who had to go into exile because although they were part of the revolution, uh, they were also being hunted after by the South African secret police. Pressure from other politicians and activists, international pressure such as the, di the divestment movement, outrageous acts by the apartheid regime, the end of the Cold War, which I think was also significant. Uh, and all of these things, I think, eventually caused the white Afrikaner Nationalist Party to realize its days were numbered especially given the potential catastrophic civil war that could have occurred, in which whites were vastly outnumbered, though better militarized. Uh, there's a book about this period called Anatomy of a Miracle. In other words, it was a miracle that a civil war was averted. It's worth noting that the Reagan administration labeled the African National Congress a terrorist organization and, uh, for years and labeled Mandela for years as a terrorist. Back-channel negotiations, however, took place between Mandela and the government. And Mandela, who was, as you know, in prison on Robben Island, uh, was freed, finally, in 1990, after 20 years, after over 20 years in prison. The white government unbanned, opposing political parties, and several years of negotiations took place, mainly between leading elites of various constituencies. So you actually have a country that is grounded in a group that was oppressed and denied power for years, but the elites actually were the ones who initially started these negotiations, members of the elite parts of these constituencies. The key compromise was actually brokered by the leader of the Communist Party, Joe Slovo. The Communist Party in South Africa uh, is quite an interesting entity and has close relations with the African National Congress. And it was truly a compromise as the former white national party leader, Mr. de Klerk, served one term as co-vice president with Mr. Mbeki under Nelson Mandela. Mandela was the nation's first democratically elected president. An interim constitution created in 1994 provided general elections, or provided general directions for the elections that resulted in Mandela's becoming president and for the establishment of a constitutional assembly 
that was then deemed to be uh, required to draft by 1996 a so-called final constitution. This constitution was supposed to be fundamentally transformative, and it contained sections also, that, and it was supposed to contain sections also designed to show that South Africa belonged to all the people, not just people who were black, for example. Uh, the term Ubuntu gets used often in the context of South Africa, uh, an African term sort of meaning social harmony. And this was sort of the ethos that was in part brought to bear with regard to these negotiations. We're not trying to kick the whites out of South Africa. That's not part of what we're doing here. Let me do, discuss a few of the more transformative components of this constitution. Uh, it has 11 official languages, uh, believe it or not, um, although uh, Zulu is the most commonly spoken nationally in business and law, English and Afrikaans are actually still dominant. The country was called the Rainbow Nation in part because of all these languages. Uh, unlike the US Constitution, which has no interpretive instructions, the South African document specifies its rights provisions be interpreted generously and purposefully. There's no room for conservative originalism here. It contains a lengthy and specific list of human rights protections that make it among the most progressive in the world. These include rights to unionize and endorsement of gay rights and numerous other forms of equality. A list of socioeconomic rights, including housing, healthcare, and education. Rights for children, rights to reproductive freedom, and authority to institute what we call affirmative action. The courts actually enforce these explicit affirmative socioeconomic rights that are in the Constitution. And that's unlike really anything comparable in the US. The Constitution continued the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which some of you may have heard of, with, which has become famous as an exemplar of restorative justice, though the story, as always, is a bit more complicated. Moreover, the Constitution pronounced that the court should examine foreign law decisions on difficult rights issues. They really had to put that in there because they had no human rights tradition. So how else build a human rights jurisprudence without putting in there, we're going to look to see what other countries have done. This is a question heavily debated in the United States, where our Supreme Court has a great division as to whether it's appropriate to look at foreign decisions on constitutional matters. Harvard Law School professor Cass Sunstein has suggested it's uh, certainly one of the uh, most important constitutions ever drafted, and there was significant foreign input into the process. For example, the rights provisions draw heavily from the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the structural provisions of the government draw heavily from Germany. The new constitutional court that was created early on acted rather courageously. The court was given the real job of approving the legitimacy of this final 1996 constitution before it became official. And the court actually used that power in one of its first decisions, I'm not making this up, to invalidate the Constitutional Assembly's first proposed new constitution. <laughs> um, this is, again, rather unusual. They found that it did not compl comply with 34 fundamental principles that early negotiators had agreed upon. Only after the Assembly made some changes did the court approve the Constitution in 1996. The court has 11 members who each generally serve 12-year terms. So unlike our court, uh, the first constitutional court was mostly white, but was made up of heroes, indeed legends of the anti-apartheid movement. Albie Sachs was among this group. Some of you may have heard of him. He was subject to an assassination attempt uh, during the uh, period of opposition to apartheid, for example. Now, the court is more representative of the nation. The Bar Association has been evolving, though diversity in the judiciary is still an issue. The court also struck down the death penalty early on as unconstitutional, even though public opinion supported the penalty. Okay? Public opinion in South Africa supported the penalty because of a huge crime problem. Indeed, that problem, the AIDS epidemic, the wealth gap, and corruption have been issues since the start. And in fact, just this week, the New York Times decided to make my point for me by publishing this article that some of you may have seen. It's an investigative piece called They Eat Money. Literally, that's what it's called. They eat money. How Mandela's political heirs grow rich off corruption. So uh, corruption is a problem in South Africa. It's important to note it says political heirs, not family heirs. So I, I do want to make that clear. <clears throat> the court is most internationally famous, perhaps, though, for its gay rights and socioeconomic rights decisions. In the latter area, it has forced the government to reallocate resources, especially in the housing area, 
try to make sure that the millions of squatters in the country had some rights to water, sanitation, shelter, electricity, and perhaps eventually small homes. But the wealth gap is the widest in the world. The wealth gap is the widest in the world. Despite a growing middle class of blacks and despite the strongest economic infrastructure in Africa, South Africa has a population, just to give you context, of over 50 million, 80% black, 9% white, and 9% what's called colored, which is not considered for most South Africans a derogatory term. It means someone of, of mixed race. During Thabo Mbeki's presidency, the president after Mr. Mandela, criticism of the ANC grew. The honeymoon was over. Mandela was not, was not immune from criticism, but somehow he had an almost saintly quality that saved him from some criticism. Mbeki's most disastrous public position was at the AIDS epidemic. This was the position the government took, late 90s, early 21st century. The AIDS epidemic was not caused by the HIV virus. Thus, the drug cocktails stopping the disease's progression among individuals internationally were dismissed for years in South Africa. In fact, at one international convention where scientists were showing various uh, chemicals and other ways of treating AIDS, South Africa's table consisted of African herbs and allegations being made that HIV AIDS was a virus concocted in part by whites as a conspiracy against blacks. So this was not the high point, in fact, really the low point of the Mbeki uh, presidency. Mr. Mbeki also alienated ANC supporters by coming across as elitist, relatively unconcerned about the poor, and ineffectual overall. Although in terms of the economy, some progress was made. He did alienate some others by supporting Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. These failures opened the door to the successful challenge from the populist Jacob Zuma in 2007. Zulu, uh, Zuma had a Zulu background, unlike many of the elite within the ANC who had what was called a Kosa tribal background. He was a polygamist, and he preferred rousing political rallies to hard policy discussions. But Zuma had served hard time on Robben Island with Mandela and as the ANC's director of national intelligence. The problem was that Zuma and many other ANC members could not resist the spoils of power once assumed. So Zuma's political and other activities were marked with scandals. I've mentioned the arms deal where one of his closest financial confidants was uh, convicted and where much of the evidence seemed to implicate Zuma too. Second, the ANC-dominated parliament disbanded the Scorpion Prosecution Agency. Doesn't that sound like an impressive prosecution agency, the Scorpions? And they were impressive. They had aggressively fought corruption as best they could given these circumstances. But they were disbanded in 2008 with the support of the ANC. Zuma was prosecuted for rape and was acquitted despite very troubling facts. Zuma spent hundreds of millions of rand dollars. Uh, at the time I was there, the rand was six to a dollar. Uh, it's definitely not worth as much anymore. It's declined in value substantially. On improvements to his mansion that were supposedly for security purposes, but were actually for things like a new swimming pool. And then he resisted repaying the monies when essentially ordered to do so. And then fifth, he was apparently and has apparently become the pawn of the Gupta family, which is the subject in great length of this New York Times article, a wealthy Indian family in South Africa that used its influence to get favorable contracts and co cabinet appointments while supporting Zuma. This has been called state capture. So everywhere you read the journals about South Africa these days in the newspapers, there's a lot of talk of state capture. And six, there are huge amounts of corruption at the local levels involving the ANC, which again, the New York Times article from this week gives specific examples of one, one area involving local corruption. Zuma also criticized the courts repeatedly as having a vendetta against him. Now, part of the problem is South Africa is what's been called a dominant party democracy, a dominant party democracy. Parliamentary elections are free and fair, yet the ANC has the only chance to win nationally. And I really do think this is part of the legacy of uh, Nelson Mandela, what the ANC did over the years, et cetera. Recent local elections suggest this may be changing somewhat, but not dramatically. The major opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, only has significant power in one province. And though it is a diverse union of apartheid opponents, both white and black, it does not resonate support with the larger black population. A series of court cases, though, has helped fight ANC corruption. For example, the Constitutional Court rejected Zuma's appointment of a national prosecutor who was viewed as fundamentally dishonest given the person's false statement in various important contexts, such as hearings. 
Imagine that. Imagine the Supreme Court throwing out one of the cabinet members of Donald Trump. So this is a court that is not afraid to be activist. This particular individual was assessed by the court as just not appropriately qualified. And that was the loose language of the Constitution that was viewed as enough language to justify the court saying he can't serve in this position. The court invalidated new prosecution mechanisms established to replace the scorpions because of inadequate independence from the executive branch. In other words, these new, this new entity was not sufficiently independent. Moreover, in 2016, the nation's brave female ombudsman, Thule Mandancela, issued a key report that Zuma be subjected to a fuller investigation on his activities and on allegations of corruption, given the large amount of evidence in this area. And her determination, her report was upheld by the courts. I think this is a crucial moment in Zuma's downfall. Further, the perception the state had been captured by people like the Guptas had taken hold. It had taken hold among the populace and undermined his appearance as a populist. If he's taking money on the one hand and saying I'm helping the poor on the other, that's not a good deal. <laughs> After tenacious lawyering by the Democratic Alliance and others, audio tapes were also obtained around 2016, helping to show why the potential prosecution, and this is amazing that it goes back so far, but audio tapes were obtained around 2016, helping to show why the potential prosecution of Zuma for the 1999 arms scandal, where his colleagues were convicted, why that prosecution was eventually stopped. And uh, these tapes, we don't know all the details, but apparently they're not favorable. These good governance, what I call good governance, and what the South Africans call good governance, statutory and constitutional provisions, have not received nearly enough praise internationally compared to the more colorful human rights provisions I've talked about. Then, this December, we've already talked about that, the ANC had a party election. Zuma was no longer eligible to run due to term limits. Uh, although the election for his replacement as national president was two years away, so there was a gap in terms of the ANC versus the national government timing. His favored candidate was one of his ex-wives who had impressive credentials and would have been a powerful example of Africa selecting female leaders. But, most believe her connections to him hurt her. Has that ever happened before? <laughs> and that in the end, uh, the other candidate, Ramaphosa, came across as the person who could best save the party in the upcoming presidential and other elections. Again, looking back on Ramaphosa's career, longtime ANC revolutionary, longtime person involved in the negotiations with whites, etc., but someone who was certainly viewed as Mandela's favorite. Ramaphosa won the party presidency in a close election, despite the fact he had become an incredibly rich business person after leaving politics. But there wasn't much evidence that stuck to him with regard to his becoming wealthy through corruption. That's probably the key. And there was a massacre that occurred, a great tragedy called the Marikana Massacre, in which 30 miners had been killed. And he had made some statements that weren't very wise, but he was able to successfully backtrack from those statements, act responsibly, uh, ran on an anti-corruption message as well as a boost the economy message given his business experience that he had obtained. So it then became obvious that Jacob Zuma and Cyril Ramaphosa could not co-govern the nation. Zuma national president, Ramaphosa president of the ANC. And eventually the ANC executive committee called for Zuma's resignation as I've already talked about. The ANC in certain respects in South Africa, it must be realized, some have said, is more powerful than the government. It's also important to mention that the Constitutional Court at the end of 2017 issued a decision ordering Parliament to establish a procedural framework for considering Zuma's impeachment, uh, were he not to resign, uh, given some of the allegations that had been made against him and given Parliament's previous failures to act strongly. Again, a rather extraordinary decision for a court to order the parliament to put into place procedural mechanisms to perhaps engage in impeachment proceedings. Now, ironically, much of the court consists of Zuma appointees. <laughs> uh, consequently, in February of this year, Zuma resigned. Ramaphosa made various announcements on the anti-corruption theme and national prosecuting authorities reinstituted National corruption authority, national prosecuting authorities reinstituted the 1999 corruption bribery charges against Zuma, which is what he appeared in court for 
on April 6th. Charges related to these 1999 corruption and bribery allegations related to this arms deal. Thus, in the end, I think the constitutional court, the Constitution, ombudsman-like figures, other uh, entities like the ombudsman, and other courts have played a crucial role in enabling South Africa to potentially get back on the right track. But what is going to happen next is unclear. There is more hope now, as I've mentioned, with regard to Ramaphosa in terms of getting on the right track. The RAND's value, though, did decline under Zuma. The economy declined. Zuma also fired an internationally respected treasury minister, and the poverty issue and the wealth gap remain. To his credit, and somewhat ironically, Zuma made some real progress on the AIDS issue. Not, not, not really on crime, but on the AIDS issue, and he deserves credit for that. Indeed, there were several, but on the crime issue, there were several horrific incidents of violent xenophobia during his tenure that cast doubt on his administration as well. It's still not clear how far Ramaphosa will go in prosecuting Zuma. It's still not entirely clear. They are still co-revolutionaries, in a sense, in terms of their legacy and their history. Ramaphosa has cut a deal allowing Zuma to use taxpayer funds to pay for Zuma's legal defense, since many of the alleged Zuma illegalities had a connection to government actions. Cynics have suggested this means Zuma will just drag out any prosecution without limit, since he has this source of money to rely upon. Some have said that Ramaphosa will not stick with this agreement, and so we shouldn't be so critical, but it is an interesting development. Some have even said it's technically illegal under statutory and constitutional provisions. However, or maybe not however, but in addition, Ramaphosa also recently dispensed Zuma to a region of the country to help the ANC prevail in some local elections. So it's a very complicated relationship. And Zuma's lawyers are arguing the prosecution itself is illegal given the time that has elapsed, the bias in the press. Although I think given the court decisions on this issue that seem to indicate that something should go forward, uh, that they're probably not likely to succeed. But whether they succeed in dragging this out is another question. The other interesting thing that's going on in South Africa is I believe resistance is in the air. The last time I was there a couple years ago was the day student tuition protests literally broke out throughout the country. An announcement came from the government that tuition was going to be increased for students who had largely thought in many ways they wouldn't have to pay much, if any, tuition for public. This is higher education at the university level where this was occurring. And I was literally there the day where we were told we weren't sure we were going to be able to have a meeting. I was with a group of people with a particular official because the official was afraid one of their uh, particular uh, friends might be put in jail because they were protesting. And um, these were some of the largest protests that have occurred since apartheid. So as I said earlier, or or, or I'm suggesting, there's some resistance in the air there. Uh, not just these student protests, but there have also been public protests over inadequate public services, unemployment, the continued poverty, the corruption, etc. Now, perhaps in response to this, Ramaphosa has announced that he will propose amending the Constitution to enforce constitutional language about taking back stolen land during the apartheid era. Now, that part of the Constitution was very carefully drafted to have a compensation provision, a little bit like the takings aspects of the US Constitution. But the proposal is to amend the Constitution to remove the compensation part. This is very much something that caters to sort of the populist component of the ANC. And it would solve a problem in that the land reform movement there has been very slow and is one of the major sources of frustration among ordinary people. It's not clear, however, that Ramaphosa means this. It's not clear this perhaps isn't just some political statements which will be pushed to a certain point but then will bog down. Ironically, this proposal created a diplomatic dispute with Australia. How does that happen? Well, Australia has a controversial national minister who recently invited, okay, he issued an invitation to supposedly besieged South African white farmers who might lose their land to move to Australia, <laughs> while Australia turned some refugees of color away, as some of you may know. Another problem is both Mandela's have now passed, and Bishop Desmond Tutu is sick. Thus, the senior statesman 
are not as present to influence the nation. So the country could go in positive or negative directions. There is hope, I think, with Ramaphosa in ways that did not exist with Mr. Zuma, particularly given the duration of Zuma's time in office. But solving the nation's problems will be complicated because fixing some could exacerbate others. Thank you. Well, I'll just start with the top one. Um, Mark, it seems that the court's autonomy is paramount to the ability to keep peace in South Africa. How secure is the court's autonomy? And what's the role of the press in all of this? Uh, obviously a very good question. Right now, the court's autonomy seems much more secure. If I can be candid, uh, under Zuma, there was a lot of criticism of the courts, both from Zuma and from supporters of Zuma, for reasons that are understandable, because the idea was it looked like the courts had a target on him. So that period has passed, it seems. Ramaphosa has not criticized, from what I understand, the courts in anything like that way. If anything, he's shown uh, great respect for the courts. The free press in South Africa has been crucial. It has been vital, and it has been very vibrant. On Sundays, the free press resembles a tabloid type journalism almost from England. I'm not saying that's a good version of a free press, but I'm saying it's so free that uh, on Sundays in particular, the, the, the press really has very interesting articles, some good, some a bit over-dramatized. But I will say that even under Zuma, and even given his criticisms, the press has been free, has been not shy about criticizing him. Books have come out that have been not shy about criticizing him and efforts to try to suppress that have not been successful. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's some hope. Uh, here, here's a, a factual question that might underlie a lot of people's questions. Um, it, 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 the question is whether the ratios that you mentioned of black, colored, and white um, members of the population of, of uh, South Af Africa, whether those ratios are contested at all. The questioner thinks they've heard of higher ratios for colored inhabitants, for example. Um, I just looked at two different sources. One source had the ratios in terms of numbers of colored and numbers of whites around 8.6 or 8.7. Another said 9%. So with the two sources, my impression was that that part is not contested. Um, I could be wrong. I, I mean, there may be scholarship contesting this because this is not an area I specialize in, namely the demographic. I don't specialize in the demographics of the racial uh, population there. I will say one thing that has occurred since the um, demise of apartheid is brain drain. In other words, many whites have left the country, gone to places like New Zealand, Australia. Some have come to the U.S. My favorite story, though, is of a gentleman who came to the U.S. and thought he was in Never Never Land in terms of happiness. He moved to Montana, which was predominantly white, set up a mechanic shop there, thought he'd do great. Things didn't work out. He hated it. He went back to the new South Africa, fearful, as you could imagine, about the black government, reestablished re his mechanic shop, and has been incredibly successful. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is, uh, I guess, a follow-on to this question about the influence of parties like the ANC. Is there any, been any uh, movement to somehow curb the party's power or, or divorce them from a constitutional role in government? So there's very much agreement, I think, among the press and among certain parts of the elite that the ANC's dominance is still too great, that they are very much thought of as, you know, without a doubt likely to win national elections and that this isn't a good thing. And not only is this not a good thing, it facilitates corruption. Okay, have there been efforts to stop that? Well, um, certainly having something like an ombudsman who's supposed to be independent and thus make judgments about the functioning of the ANC. And they have other entities like an ombudsman. They have a gender commission that's part of their constitution. They have a human rights commission. These entities are supposed to perform the uh, uh, function of focusing on those areas and pointing out where the government has committed flaws. Uh, in addition, a dispute that has occurred in South Africa has involved something called floor crossing in the parliament. And floor crossing is where one person is elected to the parliament and then once in parliament tries to join the other party. And that's been something that's been disputed and certainly 
uh, opponents of a strong ANC have on occasion spoken up very vigorously against floor crossing for fear that some of the people, once they're in parliament, will decide they want more power, and the way to get more power will be to cross over to the ANC. There are counter arguments there, um, but there really haven't been systematic changes looked at in a way that would take away this level of popularity, and to do so would be interesting because you'd run into some elements of trying to do that, which would be potentially anti-democratic. So at this point, I'd have to say not as much as we would like, but there would be some danger. And that's what I tried to hint at at the end, that some of the solutions create more problems. You make it harder for the ANC, do you then make it less democratic? Those are the kinds of trade-offs you have to think about. Here's a really tough question. Um, the questioner notes that inequality over land ownership and the general lack of land reform has been a big problem in, in uh, post uh, post apartheid uh, South Africa. Uh, the question is how could large scale land distribution in South Africa be carried out in a constitutional manner? Is it at all feasible? I confess to thinking it would be difficult to do under the current constitution. Um, and given, I think, some of the uh, basic facts, which are that South Africa has decided for better or for worse, and this is a very important decision, that it does want to be a multiracial democracy. When blacks gained power, they did not want whites to leave, for the most part. There are exceptions, of course. But I think for the most part, there was uh, certainly Mandela, there's no doubt, and, and some of the other leaders. Um, there are factions of the African National Congress. Uh, there's actually a party that's broken off from them called the Freedom Fighters that are more radical and that uh, take a view that that kind of widespread land distribution could be done if you elected a parliament of freedom fighters. <laughs> but if you have a parliament made up of the ANC and their leader is Ramaphosa, who was by all accounts, although a revolutionary with the ANC, also very much a good businessman in the quote unquote Washington consensus neoliberal version of the word, it, it, it's hard to see that happening. Now, having said that, Ramaphosa, though, obviously realizes he has a credibility issue in terms of his wealth and et cetera. And so this proposal to allow for uh, removal of lands without compensation, if it went forward, would allow such a thing to potentially occur. But I'm somewhat skeptical that he's going to push that all the way through. So. Um, <clears throat> one of the questioners wanted to, to note that um, my colleague, Adrian Wing, at the UI Law School was, was very involved, uh, and she's currently the head of the UI, the UI Center for Human Rights, has spoken here several times, I think. Um, she was involved in the creation of the South African Constitution. Are, are you f at all familiar with the role she played? So, yeah, I've gotten to know Adrian over the years uh, well, and, and she was involved even earlier than I was, and, and that's a great thing, but I do have a great story to tell. <laughs> Uh, the first time I, uh, well, not the first time, but one of the first times I was traveling around South Africa after being there, I arrived at the same conference, and Adrian was going to be speaking at the conference, and so was I. We were put in a dorm. This is just a story, but it, I think it's kind of cute. Um, <laughs> we were put in a dorm room because those were the spare rooms they had, and the rooms were fine. I locked myself in my own dorm room, <laughs> couldn't get out, and Adrian freed me. So, <laughs> So to this day, I view Adrian as the great liberator. <laughs> um, we are, I, have, I have one question myself as, uh, as the que uh, part of the host here. Uh, I'd like to um, note that um, Professor Kendi and I have both just been at a conference, a very excellent conference that his center put on uh, over the weekend at Drake on the question of democracy generally around the world and whether it's threatened. Um, we talked a lot there at that conference about uh, the problem of dominant parties and dominant characters, dominant, dominant political actors, and the question of populism as well. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering what you think about how South Africa fits into that, and I'm particularly wondering, is the populism that you've mentioned, uh, that Zuma, for example, uh, exemplified, is that really the same kind of populism, or is that more just the, the very strong identification of many of the blacks with, uh, with the, the black liberators? That's a great question, and, 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 it's, and it's a tough one. Let me, let me try to answer it in a couple ways. So obviously, this is such a well-educated group, 
in Eastern Europe right now, we have some things going on that are rather difficult you know, in the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, uh, but not just in Eastern Europe, Venezuela. We have leaders who um, are elected democratically, it seems, but then use the democratic process in ways, it seems, to restrict freedom. And many of them have populist mentalities, certainly in Hungary, the appeal to nationalism, the appeal to the, the great Hungarian tradition. I know a little bit more about Hungary because my family is actually, it's actually Hungarian. Um, so uh, to compare that to South Africa, I think might be a little bit unfair to South Africa. I mean, let's face it, South Africa underwent all of these years of apartheid. The idea that blacks would not be proud and excited and um, uh, in, in a sense support a populist, uh, I think is, is, is perhaps something that would be unreasonable to expect, nor is it necessarily a bad thing that, that there was a populist leader. I just think this particular populist leader was corrupt. <laughs> So uh, I don't think it's quite the same thing. Having said that, there are elements that are similar, but I think this particular populist leader's corruption um, does make it more problematic. Uh, we now conclude our program. And before we actually give a round of applause to Mark Kendi, uh, when we were talking here, I asked because I assumed he was here to um, do something at our law school, but in fact, no, he just drove over from Des Moines uh, last night just for to speak to us. So with that in mind, uh, let's give him a big round of applause. And I also want to thank our sponsors, the U of I's international programs, the U of I's honors program, the U of I Public Policy Center, the UI Stanley UI Foundation support for their generous uh, financial support also today's special sponsors, Mike Carberry and John Menninger, and as always, thanking City Channel 4. And Mark, uh, one last thing. <laughs> and we all know the joke. We want to present you with the highly coveted <laughs> Iowa City Foreign Relations <laughs> mug. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>